Hello, everyone. I have to tell you that old hairy legs does not want this video out there. I have had so many technical difficulties. I'm actually referring to an old camera on my laptop and a really bad microphone because my phone just kept acting up. It was crazy. I'd get 20 minutes in and then it would just shut down on me. So here I am coming to you with compassion and with my raw, honest road with abortion. And it's not been an easy one. And I want you all to know whether you have had one or if you were a part of one, man or woman, that Jesus loves you more than you can ever imagine. And that you too fell for the lies that old hairy legs, Satan, the ruler of the world, told us. So for 45 years, I'd say about 45 years of my life, that's longer than Roe versus Wade has been in law and why I'm coming to you because you asked me, so many of you came to me and said, I really want your opinion on this. But you need to know for 45 years, I didn't think there was anything wrong with abortion. Shouldn't it be a woman's right to choose what she does with her body? Especially in cases like rape, incest, or the mother's health or life is at risk? I believed what the world told me. I used the phrase, my body, my choice. And I will have to say that I had a few scares in my life about being pregnant. Thank you, God. I didn't actually have a pregnancy and I didn't have to make a decision, but I'm going to tell you, I may have made the choice to have an abortion because of the shame, because I didn't want to tell my parents, because I didn't want people to see me pregnant, and mostly just because of my own selfishness. I didn't want to ruin my life with a baby. I had all these aspirations to make money in corporate America, and that's what I should do to be happy. And this baby's just going to mess it all up. So I believed what this world said, that abortion was okay, that we have control of our own bodies, that it's my right. <laughs> oh, and then... When God found me in 2013, I had to face all of the teachings of the Catholic Church and all of the ways that I didn't believe any of them. And abortion happened to be the last one that I came to. The last one where my body, my mind, meaning I logically understood why, move down to my heart. God finally made me understand and realize how precious and sacred life was from the moment of conception till natural death. But we are going to talk about how did I come there? And what had happened was I was afraid to even speak about abortion in the beginning of my ministry when I was out speaking about my faith. Because I didn't really have an argument to counter some of the stuff that the world told me. And oh, by the way, for 45 years, I never even looked up what an abortion was. I didn't even know what Planned Parenthood did or how brutal it was. I had no idea how advanced an embryo could be in the short few weeks of life. And I really never looked at it as a, as a human being. And science unequivocally, it's done. For a life starts at conception. I'm not talking about viability here. I'm talking about life. And I'm going to share a few things with you. I'm actually sitting on the ground. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Um, I want to share with you what happens when a baby is six weeks old, the heart is beating. At eight weeks old, the baby is moving. At nine weeks, all basic physiological functions are present. 
At 10 weeks, vital organs begin to function, hair and fingernails begin to form. By the way, an abortion pill can be taken up to 10 weeks. I mean, it's practically a full-blown baby, which at 11 weeks, the baby can move freely in the womb. And at 12 weeks, the baby has taken on the human form in all relevant respects. And then after 15 weeks, and by the way, there's only six countries outside of the U.S. who permit abortion after 20 weeks. We're in the minority here in the United States, friends, and the rest of the free world. And by the way, that includes a lot of third world countries. So let's not even go there with poverty. After 15 weeks, they would need to dilate and the extraction of the baby with surgical instruments to crush and tear the unborn child to get it out of the mother. And that, my friends, is a pretty barbaric process. Think about it. And then I actually saw what an abortion was about. And I know this because I know people now. Here's the difference. Back until I was 45, I only knew one person who had an abortion and we didn't ever talk about it. But then once I found God in my life and my faith, I, I was introduced to a lot of people who had had not just one, but three or five abortions. And then Abby Johnson, bless her heart, she was a director at Planned Parenthood, one of the most profitable, if you will, locations. She had to go in and help a doctor who used ultrasound to perform the abortion. And it was the first time that she knew that the baby felt the pain and it was a baby because she could see. She saw the baby move and try to avoid being ripped apart, sucked apart. And that changed her to the point where she left her job and tried to go to some other Christian faiths, but she was kind of turned away because of her view on abortion. And then she be became Catholic. She actually spoke at the Republican, Republican National Convention. And I want to say this, this is not a political thing. I used to call myself a fiscal Republican and a social Democrat. And it has nothing to do with politics. This is good and evil. This is Satan and God. Because let's think about it. We are made in the image of God. We are also a man and a woman who will leave their mother and their father and join together and become one flesh. That isn't just the intercourse, the marital act when you become one flesh, but you have a child, a baby. God's commandments is be fruitful and multiply. And it's based on Jesus and God the Father. The love between both of them was so intense and so beautiful that the Holy Spirit was the third person of the Holy Trinity. Why did Jesus come to earth as a baby? I think this is the whole point. Jesus is trying to help us realize how precious life is in the womb. Mary, she was in a time and a day and age when she was pregnant. She wasn't married. She could have been stoned to death. How many people are going to believe her? Oh, it's God in me. I, the Holy Spirit came over me and, and produced Jesus in my womb. <laughs> I mean, come on. Think about how she took herself and completely ignored her worries about the world and what could possibly happen to her. And she just said, Lord, I am your handmaid and said yes. And honestly, that's how I feel. That's why I'm speaking about this, because I live for an audience of one. And that's Jesus Christ. I know I am going to have to look at him and make an account for my life and the decisions. Did I 
keep my mouth shut because I was worried about what you might call me, any labels or some chastisement from the pro-abortion side of the house? Because honestly, it's not pro-choice. Unless you say, yes, I'm going to choose to murder my baby. You never hear those words. And that's why I was pulled into the lies too. And I never looked things up. I never did any research. I just believed it because politicians were saying it. Celebrities were saying it. It's what the world says. So I might as well go along. And boy, I certainly don't want to have anyone, you know, call me names for believing what I believe. And even at that time, I didn't even really know what I was believing. So I want to go there. Let's see. Reproductive rights. Bodily autonomy, my body, my choice, reproductive justice. And then come in and they say, we will get rid of your pregnancy tissue or we will have a termination of pregnancy. When you really think about what it is, killing a living human being and the most innocent, I don't know how you could really in your heart believe that there's a reason that we should do that. It's just like slavery. Do we have the right to manipulate and own another human being? Are they not the same class as every other human being? This is like a whole subhuman, subculture human. If we reduce children in the womb, the most innocent, to not having certain rights in certain instances. So here we go with the arguments, right? What about incest? What about rape? What about if the mom's life is in danger? All right, I'm going to put these links in all of underneath so that you can look at these articles yourself because I don't want this to be a really, really, really long, uh, long video. Hang on, I'm trying to find where I where I left off here. Okay. <sighs> Jaime Gordon, MD, Director of Medical Genetics of the Mayo Clinic, quote, there are no medical indications for terminating a pregnancy. I didn't say it. This doctor said it. Okay. People habitually overestimate the number of abortions committed for the classic hard cases of rape and incest, eugenics, and life and health of the mother, a common error that is not at all discouraged by pro-abortionists. 30 years ago, Dr. Irving Kushner, professor of obstetrics at UCLA School of Medicine, testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee. When one of the senators asked him how often abortions are necessary, whether to save the life of the mother or to preserve her physical health, Dr. Kushner, who was strongly pro-abortion, answered, in this country, about 1%. And this number hasn't changed. During the years of 1996 to 2020, the states of Florida, Louisiana, Minnesota, Nebraska, South Dakota, and Utah compiled data on the reasons women obtain abortions. Of the 2.4 million aborting women surveyed, only 1.14% replied that they were having abortions to protect their lives or physical health. There's a graph on this article and in this link that is flabbergasting. Almost 95% is social and economic reasons. Less than 1% birth defects, less than 1% mental health of the mother, physical health of the mother, and rape or incest. So what about rape or incest? It's horrible. I can't imagine. I have not been raped or have been sexual assaulted. Thank you, God. I can't imagine the trauma, the, oh, I can't, just all of these emotions just keep coming into my mind and I can't imagine how overwhelming it is. And then to think, 
I'm supposed to have this baby with this man's sperm in me and his DNA. And then I met people who were survivors, who were given life from their mother who was raped and who had been forced into this pregnancy. God allows things. Let's go back to the book of Job. Job, an innocent man who's so devoted to God, Satan comes to God and says, hey, you know, this guy's just like this because you're filling him with grace and you won't let anything bad happen to him. And God said, all right, fine, go ahead. Do whatever you want to him, but don't touch a hair on his head. And so Satan took away everything, his family, his livelihood, all of his animals that were his livelihood were killed. And of course, back in that day, when things like that happen to you, you must be sinful. And so all of his friends, they're like, you better repent from what you're doing. Obviously, God is upset and mad. And Job never lost his faith. And this is why we need to live for an audience of one. That we need to remember that we're going to look at Jesus one day. And I don't ever want to say, I didn't speak up about where you came into my heart and made me realize what abortion really was and how precious and sacred life is. You are the author of Life and Death, Lord, and you brought Jesus to earth as a baby. And then Mary went to visit Elizabeth and her baby, St. John, in her womb jumped for joy. I mean, these are living beings and God created them in his image and likeness. Not only that, but he knew us before we were in the womb. This is the amazing thing. He knitted us in the womb. He made us fearfully and wonderfully made. He's got purpose and meaning for every single one of us, including that little baby growing in your stomach. If you are looking at this video and you're thinking about what you need to do, God has a purpose for that baby. He can bring good out of bad, even if you are in the situation of rape or incest or it's forced on you. That baby could become the biggest speaker of love that, that can overshadow any evil. Forgiveness and God just growing inside of you and you accepting this circumstance that God allowed, he allowed it for a reason because he probably has some great plans for that baby and Satan doesn't want that baby on the earth. He doesn't want anyone speaking truth. He wants us all to fall for his lies that I fell for for 45 years of my life. And it was only when I started reading the word of God where I truly heard his voice. Now, God does not say, I don't allow abortions or there shall be no abortion. Abortion is not in the Bible, but murder is thou shalt not kill, especially innocence. So I'm going to go there because this matters what God tells us. Okay, let me go up here. Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, you shall not murder. Mark 7, 20 through 23, and he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of a man, out of the heart of you, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within and they defile a person. Job 3.16. I mean, he was so like, Lord, why did you even have me be born if this is the way my life is going to be? He says, or why was I not as a hidden stillborn child, as infants who never see the light? You may feel like that. You may feel like you, your life is ruined. And it's not. God allowed this to happen for a reason. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. 
For I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my father who is in heaven. Matthew 18, 10. Matthew 19, 14. But Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. Psalm 123, whoops, 127, 3. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. Rescue those who are being taken away to death. Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, behold, we did not know this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who keeps watching over your soul know it? And he, and will he not repay man according to his works? Proverbs 24, 11 through 12. The blood of the innocent, and I'm going to wrap up with a couple of these. Cursed be anyone who takes a bride to shed innocent blood. And all the people shall say, Amen. That's Deuteronomy 27 through 25. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. You should listen to all these, by the way. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises, that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. Genesis 9, 5 through 6, And for your lifeblood I will require a reckoning. From every beast I will require it, and from man. From his fellow man I will, requ I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of of man, by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. Luke 1, chapter 44, verse 44. For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. That was Elizabeth when Mary came to visit her. Jeremiah 1, 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Psalm 22.10 On you I was cast from my birth and from my mother's womb. You have been my God. Choosing life. There's two more I'm going to wrap up with. Two, Second Kings 8 8 through 12. And Hazael said, Why does my Lord weep? He answered, Because I know the evil that you do. Because I know the evil that you will do to the people of Israel. You will set on fire their fortresses, and you will kill their young men with the sword, and dash in pieces their little ones, and rip open their pregnant women. Deuteronomy 30, 19, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live. All right, there's one more. Okay, so. Modern medicine has virtually eliminated avoidable maternal deaths due to pregnancy. Alan Guttmacher of Planned Parenthood did more to promote and spread abortion on demand throughout the world than any other individual. Nearly 50 years ago, he commented, today it is possible for almost any patient to be brought through pregnancy alive unless she suffers from a fatal disease such as cancer or leukemia. And if so, abortion would be unlikely to prolong, much less save her life. Certainly, with all the advances in medicine since then, cases in which women's pregnancy threatens her health are even rarer today. That was way back nearly 50 years ago. And in 1990, 
because of the medical advancements with, with uh, ultrasound, reformed abortionist Bernard Nathanson said, the situation where the mother's life is at stake were she to continue a pregnancy is no longer a clinical reality. Given the state of modern medicine, we can now manage any pregnant woman with any medical affliction successfully to the natural conclusion of the pregnancy, the birth of a healthy child. In 1974, the father of Fetology, Jaime Gordon, this was the first quote I said, director, director of medical genetics at the Mayo Clinic, stated, in more than 25 years now of medical practice, I have come to learn that if a woman is healthy enough to become pregnant, she is healthy enough to complete the term, in spite of heart disease, liver disease, almost any disease. As far as I'm concerned, there are no medical indications for terminating a pregnancy. In 1981, Dr. Jasper Williams of the Bernard Hospital in Chicago, past president of the National Medical Association, said, since 1953, I have never seen a patient die because she needed an abortion and it could not be performed. Doctors now have the tools and the knowledge with which to work so that they can handle almost any disease a patient may have, whether that patient is pregnant or not and without interrupting the pregnancy. You know, we can go on and on, but the end game is this. Even if you have a child that has Down syndrome or you've taken that test, I know people who have given birth to babies with defects and it has changed their lives for the better. Their other children have so much more compassion for people and they wouldn't change it. They, they love that child just as they are. And that child brings even more joy and a different compassion into that family and those around that person. This is why things are different for me, not only because of God's word, not only because of technology advancements, but because of the people that I have talked to and the women and the men and the children who have survived what otherwise could have been them being aborted, murdered in their mother's womb. It really isn't a gray thing. It's black and white. As I said, it's good and bad, Satan versus God. And we need to have a different conversation. We need to share pregnancy information and donate to these places volunteer at these places, give our heart to these poor young women, middle-aged women, older women, have them know that they are not chastised from society, quite the opposite. We value them so much. We want them to bring this life into the world because you never know what God has planned for that soul, for that baby. It happened because God allowed it. And we are not the author of life. And that is what I'm really trying to say, is that we need to remember that societal pressures, I know there are financial pressures, but there are so many ways and avenues and organizations that are there to help you with parenting classes, with ultrasounds, with medical assistance. It's no longer how it was 50 years ago where you didn't want to tell your mom or dad, I think that this needs to have a different conversation. How can we bring this child to life? Maybe there's someone who is desperately wanting a child and would love to adopt your baby. I, there's other people that are like, oh, there's so many kids that need adoption. What about foster care? Blah, blah, blah. But right now I'm talking about terminating a life, killing a soul that God created. And there are a lot, we, who knows what God's plans are for that baby. And you as a mother and or a father or a relative to someone, you have to think deeper because this is a big decision and you're going to have to account for that decision. And if you've already done this, do not fear. God is a merciful God. I pray for anyone who is Catholic 
whether you have fallen away and you're in a whole different church or whatever the case may be, you are always Catholic. All you have to do is go to the sacrament of reconciliation because you have cut yourself off from God with this sin. When we commit mortal sin, we cut ourselves off from God. God turns, our, turns and we turn. We go opposite ways. But when we reconcile, reconciliation, cilia, little hairs, like eyelashes, we become face to face with God again. He's so merciful. And I know so many women who repent so bad, feel so horrible for the decision that they made. And there is such freedom, mercy, forgiveness in reconciliation. Go to confession. You will not regret it. That was how I found God. That was my first encounter with God, going to confession in 2013. I hadn't been there in 26 years. I had many other mortal souls, um, mortal sins on my soul, excuse me. And that was a game changer. I knew God existed because I was so afraid when I went in there. And then I had this spiritual, amazing supernatural experience with God. I knew he loved me. I knew he forgave me. I knew I had value on this earth and that he had a special role for me. Life just changed that minute. Everything pivoted for me. It was incredible. And lastly, we've got to be compassionate. This is a very emotional topic. And I don't like seeing names being called or people name people being called names where you throw things at someone in such an uncharitable way. We have to learn how to speak with love, speak truth with love. I'm going to do a video series on that because I truly believe that we need to speak truth. We're called to be honest with ourselves and others, but we need to do it with love not with judgment. This video, if it has come across judgmental, that is not the intent because I have no right throwing any stones. I give it all to God. That's God's judgment. But I do know that I'm going to have to face God and account for my life. And I just want to remind others of that too. I don't judge any of you for what you've done or what you may do or who you are right now. I just want to bring my journey through this abortion, this clear teaching that I, it wasn't clear for me for so long. I didn't really know why I believed what I believed. I just believed it because it was out there. You know, that was what society told me. And once you see an abortion and you see body parts that that the clinicians have to put back together and you talk to people who worked in these places or, or who have had multiple abortions, you realize the, the trauma and how devastating it really is. And then I see people who are so callous about it and so angry. And that's where I say, okay, maybe that person doesn't have the Holy Spirit in them. Maybe they have, you know, don't think Satan isn't around devouring souls left and right. And there could even be, I'm not judging, I'm just saying, maybe they're supporting it because they kind of feel guilty and they feel like, hey, I need to support it because then it kind of validates the decision that I made. I don't know. I, I don't profess to know. I've never been in, the, in those shoes. But I do see a lot of anger. And it's emotionally charged and it's unnecessary. There should be no anger. So this whole Roe v. Wade thing is just about constitutional. Is it lawful? In this country that was basically developed, the Constitution was in God we trust. It is a God country. So... When I look at the Constitution, I don't believe that God would say, yes, it is your right to 
murder an innocent person. And that is what abortion is. We have to call it what it is, face what it is, and learn about these arguments, whether they are arguments at all. Because I look at God and I say, well, if you allowed this to happen to me, you bring good out of everything for those who believe in you. It may not be the best situation or the way that we would want it to be. Trust me, I wish God would have pulled me out of the pits of hell way before 42 years old. The mistakes that I made and the sins that I committed and the shame. Oh my gosh, but that's not what he wanted. I think he wanted me to go through all of that so that I can share how much he healed me and how much he changed me. And the Holy Spirit that lives within me, I have now chosen to share with everybody. I'm pretty vulnerable with you all. And this has been a long video, but I don't want to cut it short. And I want to end with also be well aware, be well aware that it is a business, that there are requests for proposals for live, not frozen baby parts. Think about that. A request for proposal is when one company goes to another company and says, I want to purchase this, but here are all my specifications for what I want to purchase. And these are babies, babies' parts. And they have a price. And it is a business. And they want your baby's parts. This is part of Abby Johnson, the movie Unplanned, the book Unplanned. Search her out. She shares the horrors and she was a person who thought that she was helping women, honestly, until the grim reality of what an abortion really was, was slapped her, slapped her in the face on the ultrasound. And thank God it did. And I praise God for giving her the courage to quit her job and to go out and start her own organization to help these women. It's a complete opposite. Her story is amazing. And if anyone knows Abby, because I would love to have an interview with her, a video interview, please forward this to her. It would be an awesome, real chick-to-chick -chick conversation that I think this world really needs to hear. I, I have some deep questions for her. All righty, everyone. I love you all. I am just sharing my heart. I'm being as open and honest with you. No judgment. Please be compassionate with people as you try to share the same thing because God is really working on your heart and we want to love women that are in this tough situation and we want to support them. So donate, volunteer, put yourself out there. I actually put on Facebook, I said, hey, put all of your pregnancy crisis centers or all these places in this stream, like in this post, and then share it all over so that people know in their neck of the woods or other, you know, opportunities and things that can help them choose life, choose God, because we are made in his image and likeness, and he is the author of life and death, not us. Don't let us fool us because that's what we've done. All right, everyone. I love you all. Have a blessed and inspired day. And now I got to figure out how to turn this off. Okay. Bye.